It's my great honor today to, to introduce Rick Jones, the Director of IT Service Management at Johnson Controls. Um, Rick uh, has a, an extensive background in process management, service management, and I, I, we're really happy to have him here join us today. So Rick, could you just spend a moment perhaps and give us a little bit of your background? Um, yes, uh, absolutely. So as David mentioned, I'm currently Director in IT Service Management um, at Johnson Controls. Um, I've worked for various other industries over the years, um, including um, also being a, a, a veteran. Um, so i um, been around the block, worked in the finance industry for about 10 years, worked in um, the, the consultancy area for another 13 years, and have just recently in the last year started my career in the manufacturing space uh, with Johnson Controls, which is um, I'm very excited about, um, and it, it ties very directly into um, our our relationship with where we are, where we're starting with Navia and what we're going to do with process management uh, to support um, all of the IT service management related processes. So it's been a long time, been a long road, but I'm excited about the future. And um, I see noticed in the in the the chats here that some of the team are on. So welcome, welcome guys. Um, but looking forward to the dialogue. Um, every industry is different, but fundamentally we all have the same challenges around process. So very That's looking really forward to having that conversation. That's very true. And perhaps you could just take a moment and just give our audience a little bit of background on, on Johnson Controls. Um, sure. Um, and, and, you know, take, take this with a grain of salt because, you know, I've only been with the company for a year. So, um, I'm learning a lot about the services that the company actually provides to their customers, but fundamentally it is a, um, a, a large manufacturing is one part of it. They, they deal with, um, smart buildings, which is the future for Johnson controls. And I'm very excited about, uh, things about automation, a lot of technology. Um, so we're, we're really we really need to get this right, and we really need to to focus on process and repeatability and everything that we're trying to do here. Um, they they also some of the services they provide are around um, HVAC, you know, um, air, air systems in buildings that are smart, um, security, fire controls, fire detection, suppressions, um, smart homes, even. Um, and and the thing that really drew me um, to what we're doing is um, the real focus on um, the environment, right? So. Uh, a lot of companies are really looking at um, being more green, being eco-friendly. Um, but I can say that, you know, Johnson, this is an area that throughout the company, um, they've really committed to and really driving that forward. So any way we can help with service management uh, and supporting the automation capabilities of the company should be really great. And it, it's going to be fun to be part of that journey, um, especially for me coming into a new a new set of industries, if you will, uh, to to really understand how the company functions and learn new things. And that's really what it's about. Well, I'll tell you, my wife works in the facilities management space and she's very familiar with Johnson Controls. And, um, you know, she she told me it's a you know great set of products. So we're glad to have you representing Johnson Controls here today. Now, for those of you um, that don't know us, we're Navia. Um, just a little bit of background on Navia. Navi has been in business since 1999, and we started our journey as process management consultants. So we would go into large organizations like Coca-Cola or the New York Stock Exchange and, and help them design, document, automate their, their processes. While doing that work, we came up with a, uh, an idea for a software product um, to make our consultants much more pr productive in business process management. And that was really the inspiration behind the Navia process designer. So fast forward a number of years, and we're no longer in the consulting space, but we're, we're very much uh, dedicated on providing uh, a process management solution, a product that can help organizations be a lot more productive, save a lot of time and money when it comes to doing business process management. If you'd like to learn a little bit more about us, you can read our reviews up on g2.com. Um, and these are just some of the badges that we've earned over the last uh, last period. So before we actually get into the conversation today, I just want to frame it. Um, what is business process management? So business process management is a set of skills. So that's the various people and resources and methods like met methodologies, practices that companies use to examine their end-to-end -end processes and make them better. And it's, it's so important in today's world, you know, with so many organizations going through digital transformation, it's really important to have a good 
handle on what your processes are today and where you want them to go so you can better you know better streamline better optimize and, and drive those cost savings and when you look at business process management as a practice there's there's a number of key areas that fall under that that discipline the first is identification or sometimes called process discovery it's amazing how many organizations might not even know or at least have a, a clear understanding of the end-to-end -end processes that they have in the organization. So identification, what are our processes? Designing and modeling. So that can be designing and modeling the as-is process, what we're doing today, and also where you want to go tomorrow so you can improve it. Business process automation, it's all the rage, uh, but you can't automate a process unless you understand it. And that's why the design, the modeling is so important to business process automation. Executing those processes, whether it's through automation or manually, monitoring and controlling to make sure people are following the processes or you're correcting any deviations in the process. And finally, all the optimization and re-engineering just to keep the organization moving forward. So that's, you know, that's how we define business process management. And that's really the focus of today's discussion. Yeah, David, I'd just like to add that, you know, it's really for for me, the 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 really the really challenge around process design and and the whole process BPM process or life cycle, if you will, is it's it's really it's connectivity to a lot of other items that augment and support process development. You know, the big challenge for a lot of companies, as you said, is actually the identification of process. You know, I think we all struggle with understanding the difference between a process, a work instruction, a procedure. You know, what does that mean? Um, and that's where you kind of have to take a step back sometimes and, and connect the whole BPM life cycle to um, really what drives a lot of process. And it's, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. I mean, for us, we're looking at a lot of, um, I, I think the big thing for me was with, with the, the product is being able to develop templates for process based on frameworks, right? Because frameworks underlie the processes and give you the guardrails, if you will, of what you should do to stay within the controls for the framework. So when we, or in the past, when I've developed or designed process, I always start with the framework. Like what, what must I do, right? And then so taking they, that. Things sorry, like, uh, those things like ITEL, COBIT. Yep, yeah. ITEL, COBIT, um, APQC, you know, they're, they're going to tell you what your process should contain. Um, and then, you know, from there, you, you really start to, you can really accelerate that design step. And, and we're, we're able to do that um, quickly because of some of the templates that are being designed within the product uh, based around these frameworks. So that's going to accelerate our ability to work with the organization to kind of explain, you know, a process isn't something that you've done for years because that's how it's evolved. Um, because you often find yourself really trapped into this world of, Sometimes you'll be out of compliance for an audit or you're not meeting regulatory requirements. Well, these frameworks give you the ability to jump into a product like Navia and actually use those templates to accelerate your process design and transform the organization and the way they work. So I'll just, I know we're going to talk more about this as we progress, but um, it, it's important to say that, you know, when you talk process management, you don't have to start from scratch, right? There are well, things you should leverage. Yeah, why reinvent the wheel? I mean, there's you're, you can stand on the shoulders of those who came before and, and leverage these frameworks. It's 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 one way of accelerating for sure. Um, what I also want to do here too is, um, you know, we've got a great group of people here on the call. I'd like to get a sense of uh, if you don't mind responding to this poll question, where does your organization, how do you see your organization's maturity in respect to business process management? Do you see yourselves in the initial stage where things are still kind of undocumented, ad hoc? Are you kind of in the repeatable stage where, you know, you can get most of your process done consistently uh, with some degree of consistency? Or are things well-defined, well-documented with clear roles and responsibilities? That would be a level three, which is actually a very, very good place to be. Or have you gone beyond that and you have a lot of uh, work around managing and monitoring your processes and continually improving them. So if you just take a moment and respond to the, the quick straw poll here, we'll be happy to share the results. I'll just give it, um, we got 48, 50% of the people have responded. Just give it another, you know, 10 or 15 seconds to give people a chance. And um, I'll just be able to share how we're, so interesting results so far. We got 72% of the respondents. 
Don't be shy. It's a button. Hey, yeah, it's just real good. I, I think we're in a, I think we can go ahead and share the results here now. So share results. Um, now I'm, do you guys see those on your screen? Yep. Okay, great. So it looks like um, about 30% of you said you're in that initial phase um, where, um, you know, things are still in a very ad hoc space. Uh, 40, it looks like the majority, 41% of you are repeatable. Um, about 23% of you are defined where you have good standards in place. Interestingly enough, 5% uh, in managed and nobody really at that level five where things are being optimized. So this is just wanted to do this to get a sense where everyone's at, but also it's, um, you know, it's really important also to understand where you sit because uh, some of the things we're talking about today might help you move up levels within the, um, within this kind of maturity level. All right, well, let's get into the meat of today's conversation. Um, so we're going to talk first about implementing a process management foundation. So Rick, what do you think some of the foundational elements that need to be in place to support a process management program? Um, I, I think we touched on this a little bit, right? It's it's the collection of, uh, you know, where, where are you going to start, right? So you've got two ways of looking at it. There's the frameworks, which I talked about briefly. Um, those are going to give you more the, you know, where, what does good look like? Where do I need to be? Um, and, and I think from that point, from a, you, you really need to start with the collection, the assessment of what's in the environment currently, right? Are we following at a high level, the basics of, let's say, you know, whether you're talking incident, problem, change, um, any life cycle process, you know, how do we do business today? And, and getting that captured, documented um, and understood, uh, but you need to have um, an area of responsibility for that. And I think that's key um, when you're talking about processes that need to be leveraged across the enterprise. And, and I'll use the enterprise term very loosely because you could be a small company and have the same the same thought process around doing it. Um, so, you know, for us, it's about understanding what's in the environment today, how it's being done. Uh, and what you'll find is you'll see du duplicative process all over the place. So, you know, what, what I'm discovering across um, several areas is that everybody's doing their own version of a process that should be centralized. Um, so how do you, you identify that? And then how do you really start to build that architecture, if you will, around how do I begin to consolidate process and standardize it and get into the design phase? So you don't know what to work with until you actually go through, you know, identification, which I think was the first, the first point there, right? What's, what, where are we at? What do we have? You know, and it could be where you're talking to teams and, you know, you get into these conversations, which are quite interesting. And this has happened to me no matter where I work is you, you make a statement like you don't have a process and they'll go, I absolutely do have a process. And you'll go, OK, show it to me and they'll go here. And it's a checklist. You're like, that's a procedure. Like, that's not a process. It's part of an activity, which is part of a process. So let's let's step back and do that. So identification of what you have. Uh, comparisons or assessments against where you, what does good look like? Are you meeting all the requirements and controls within the frameworks? Um, and that's really the foundation of where you want to begin the journey. And it is a journey. It's not going to end. Um, and it's a journey that continues as long as you employ things like process, you know, continual service improvement or process improvement. Uh, it's a cyclical activity, but you don't know where you're going if you don't know where you're at. You know, one of the interesting things you brought up, Rick, is area of responsibility. You know, so you, you so first of all, you said you go and talk to these different departments and you find out people are doing the same process, but they're they're doing it independently in their own area. Um, and also you have people documenting processes, some are document actually capturing procedures. So do you think there's a specific skill set or a, a specific set of talents that are that are really required to do effective process management? Um, that's a, that's a really good question. I haven't really given much thought. To and just, um, just to, just to follow up on that in, in terms of like, um, you know, so you have these different departments and you have some guy who might be the head of, um, I don't know, change management, for example, are they really a process management specialist? Do they really know how to document design? Right. right. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting because everybody in some form, wherever you are in IT has done process, right? And, and I'm saying that at a very generic term when we talk about process. 
And, you know, we've all dealt with, okay, I'm going to document a process and I'm going to fire physio or I'm going to fire something like that and or PowerPoint and drop a bunch of boxes in and put arrows from one box to another. And there's my process, right? Um, I, I think everybody can learn to do process design, you know, using, you know, BPMN and, and, and doing it, you know, the way a, a true process designer would do it. Um, I don't think it's a unique skill, but it's a skill that we all believe we have that could be matured. Um, and, and I think you'll see that a lot when you are able to take some of these individuals who are running their own version of a process, but I think centralizing it or having a body of governance who are setting process standards, process design uh, controls, process inventory, process tooling, maturity assessments. What we found in larger enterprise organizations is that you need a body to provide that level of governance over how the organization designs process. You could distribute process design, um, but there needs to be some level of compliance applied to that or governance applied to that so that everybody's doing it the same way with the same right. tool in the same location. So I don't think it's necessarily, I guess it's, it's, the answer is yes and no, right? So it is a, it is a skill set. I think it's a skill set that everybody has the ability to develop or mature. Mm -hmm. But I think to your point, though, it's really important to have a central area of responsibility to, to provide assistance when someone needs it, to provide some of that training, some of that guidance, and, and also yeah. to make sure things are improved and monitored. And, and I think we're going to I think we're going to talk about that one a little later, because I think I, I mentioned something in terms of my perspective of how this gets run. Um, that was interesting to you. And I know we're going to talk about that in, here in a little bit. Um, but the, the other foundational points that I want to call out here are, you know, we talked about skills, right? Process design skills and how do you mature that and, and identify that in people. I think tools is another big foundational element. Um, mm -hmm. I talked about the fact that, you know, back in the day we used to use, you know, Visio for the, for the flows. We used to use Excel for the activity descriptions and definitions. And we used to use Word to pull it all together and copy and paste everything into a process design doc or a process definition document. Um, very cumbersome, which is, you know, getting to a point where now we can leverage Navia, for example, as all of that, as our process repository, as our workflow designer, and it, you know, as our as our attribute collector to produce a process definition document at a click at the end is going to save a lot of time. A um, couple other things to note is leadership support. Um, you know, process uh, the, a process function will not be no function will really be successful without true leadership support and backing. Uh, to do that. Um, and last but not least is kind of the organizational maturity to be able to absorb process and understand the difference between processes and activities and, and the fact that the, the process drives the RACI and you can't just say, I'm going to create a RACI. Well, that's great, but RACI based on what? It's, it needs to be based on process. Um, and we talked about governance, um, just throwing out some ideas. And at the end of the day, your process should be able to support not just operations, but also um, the, the controls that are going to be up need to be applied from uh, compliance and GRC. I mean, I think that's a big driver for a lot. And, and we often don't tie that together with process design. It's process to get the work done, but it also needs to adhere to certain compliance aspects in GRC as well. Yeah, and I guess that's one of the one of the areas I was coming from is sometimes the the people we delegate process design work don't realize all of those different connections the governance the controls the continual improvement you know they focus on you know they'll do a great job of of, of drawing the visio or the you know putting it into navia and creating the flowchart but it's those other aspects that are so important to the overall process management program really good yeah point. we've kind of talked about that a couple of times here right like so process design is just like any other IT function it is a it is a function within an organization but it has uh interconnectivity with the entire organization and being aware of that um will often make you think differently you know I use the analogy of a Rubik's cube right you know a lot of times if you're working in a function you try to solve the Rubik's cube in one direction uh but until you pick it up and actually start to turn it around and look at all angles you can solve that faster. And I think that's a good way to approach this as well as any function. Great. So one of the other things um, that we've seen, at least I've seen from my career, is, is a lot of resistance to process work. And there's always a lot of excuses, right? Well, we, you know, we're too busy. We don't have time. Uh, 
wow, we can't come to all these different workshops to, to figure out what's going on or why do we need to improve? We're doing a great job today. So when when dealing with organization change, there's there's often a lot of resistance, especially when it comes to designing, governing, or improving the processes. Do you have any tips on, on addressing those elements of organizational change? Um, I think, yes. So <laughs> I think the big one is it's almost like a sales job in some ways, right? So, you know, you, you're, you're going to get buy-in if you explain the value, right? If you, because the question is going to be, what's in it for me? Right. You know, I, I'm going to invest my time and my energy and my attitude based on what I'm going to get out of it, right? So it really, whether you're defining services or defining process or defining anything, and it's going to require a certain amount of effort on behalf of the, the, the individual you're working with, um, you're gonna you're gonna face certain levels of resistance because th they realize it's gonna be effort, right? And and they may not, you know, I'm too busy. I've got these six other projects I'm working on. So really, you have to answer that question first, which is the "what's in it for me" question. You know, this is a way for you to visualize how you work, identify areas to to streamline your work, to free up time, to to automate components of what you do, to, again to free up time, and and that's the value you'll get out of this if you just invest the time up front. And if, I can just, sorry, if I can just interject there, I mean, the, the what's in it for me is, is so important, but it, it can be, it's different for different people, right? So the what's in it for me for this, the CIO is, is quite a bit different than what it is for someone on the service desk. So yeah. if a, a good process makes their job easier on the service desk, but it can also result in, a, in, in reduced cost or time savings or a different type of a return on investment for a senior person. And I think you have to be cognizant Mm -hmm. of, of those different levels in the organization if you're selling it because you can't tell everybody that you know a cmdb is great because we have relationships between all the, the configuration items someone's going to glaze over when they hear that but others will look at that and say oh that's awesome so it can change right depending on who you're talking to yeah and it depends on the scope of what you're doing right so you know defining the change management process is valuable to many stakeholders right so i think that's part of that's part of the identification phase is identify all the stakeholders and leadership will always be a stakeholder because the question they're going to ask is, is this going to give me savings? Like, how do I, how do I reduce my cost through automating process? Um, you know, the, the people who do the work are going to benefit because it frees up time and allows them to work on more value add um, projects, if you will. Um, but again, leadership's going to want to know that, you know, I'm going to invest the time of my resources to get what out of it from a return perspective. And it may be um, you'll be able to do more strategic projects and add more value to the company. And, you know, there's returns there. So you kind of have to think again, like all aspects of the Rubik's cube and who your stakeholders are well, when you're, when you're going after specific types of process and, and you can't, you really need to look at the process, who the stakeholders of those processes are at all levels of the organization. Um, and then really tell your message from an OCM perspective around What's the value to you as I present what I'm going to need from you in order to successfully design this? So we have a question that just came in from Donna. Hey, Donna, it's been, been a long time. Um, your question is almost every uh, state of report, you know, to, uh, whether it's uh, the state of Agile, the state of ITSM, the state of DevOps, cites a lack of management support is the greatest challenge to overcome. Why aren't managers supporting these new ways of working? <laughs> Boy. I'm, I'm digesting the question because it's a very, very deep question. It um, is. I'm, I'm trying to, I'm trying to, I'm trying to define the term state of report. Um, well, you know, it, are, are we successful? I, the way I interpret it, are we being successful with agile? Are we really adopting DevOps? And a lot of times I think people come back and say, you know what? This DevOps program isn't working here. This ITSM program, you know, it's it's not delivering results. So I think that and and, and Donna, feel free to clarify um, the um, the question. But that's how I interpreted it. Yeah. So I, it's an interesting question because I think you know again we get into the components of process, right? And and what those components deliver to to defining the state, the state of the nation, if you will, for these various frameworks and process areas, right? It's, it's no different than being on a call and having somebody kind of say, well, I, you know, in, in order to be successful, I have to build a RACI. And my, my pushback is, well, you can't build a RACI if you don't know what the activities are and who's responsible, accountable, consulted, or informed. 
for that particular activity. Likewise, another component of process is metrics, right? What are the metrics you're going to define, the KPIs, the OLAs, the SLAs for specific activities within a process? If you're doing true process design effectively, you're going to identify or you need to remember to identify those metrics where you can have the conversation around here's the state of the maturity for our agile processes for leadership. But at the same time, I think, you know, IT been in a long time as we all have, right, is we've evolved from in the last 30 years, IT's evolved from a very transactionary um transaction driven organization. I get a ticket, I do the work, I close the ticket, I move on, right? And management managers, um, we've all grown up in that environment where I have a queue, I mean, I need to plow through that. I had this many tickets last month, I have this many tickets this month, I'm doing a great job because I've reduced the number of tickets. That, that managerial responsibility of reporting has to shift to be more around um, things that we've talked about, right? So am I delivering value? Am I hitting my KPIs? Where, do, where am I slowing down? You know, you can introduce things which we'd love to do as well, which is introduce things like take Six Sigma seriously, you know, really dive deep as you can into these processes to identify areas that are truly going to improve and apply the metrics to that. So I think how managers manage um, is transforming. And managers who do it well are those managers who have managed to, a lot of manager terminology in there, but they've managed to grow their own managerial skills to look at things like KPIs and metrics and measurements and look beyond the queue, right? And go deeper into the assessment of, is my process actually being adopted? Is it effective? And how do I report that back to leadership, whether it's a success or I need to shift gears? You know, you, when we um, just before the webinar started, you know, we were chatting, you and I, and uh, one of the things you talked about was, you know, the sales pitch. Um, and I, I think a lot of times the the people who are trying to implement these process improvement programs and the WIFM, it comes into the what's in it for me as well. The people trying to implement these programs aren't doing an effective job of really selling the value and where the return on investment is. And if you can if you can sell the value in terms of you know if you want leadership support you need to explain to leadership in terms that they clearly understand what what the benefits are and you need to be able to demonstrate that so sometimes starting you know we used to have an old saying when we were consultants design wide and implement narrow meaning you know understand what your big process management program is going to be but get one process up and running really effectively and show somebody the benefits which can then in turn help you sell the next improvement and the next process, and then maybe even, you know, further down the road. So I have, maybe it's I, a question I, of, you know, what are the skills of the new world manager, right? Or, or the, the digital manager, the skills of digital managers needs to change, right? So think, think more business related type process reporting versus transactional type of process reporting. Right. Yeah. It's, it's, it's really, you know, the one big failure is when I hear people say, we're going to implement ITIL. Like, what does that even mean? You know, they can't implement a framework. And the, the really thing is you want to do is process management. So you, A, you got to sell the value of process management. B, you got to demonstrate you're delivering on the value. And then only when you're doing that, I think you can get the, the overall support. Because there are organizations out there and you can see them in the way they perform. There's a reason Amazon, can, hey, we, we get same day delivery here for some products. That's not happening without process. So someone took process seriously enough to have same day delivery of, of, of the stuff you're ordering. And, and there's the value proposition. They believe in it. How did that get sold? So, you know, you have to be able to communicate it in terms of, as Rick said, values, value to the business. Well, I, th I think the, uh, the other interesting thing, which you just made me think about was this, right? So here we all service management professionals, right? So we're living the life of idle um, and, 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 they go and change the entire framework, right? Version four is very different than version three. You know, I grew up in the version two, three era and it made sense to me, right? So they were giving me the guardrails on my road and I could drive anywhere in that road as long as I don't crash through the guardrails and fall off of it, right? So, you know, looking at the five books and, you know, okay, well, this giving me the guidance around what an incident process should look like. And all of a sudden here comes version four. And now we're talking value streams and value chains and everything else. And 
that's a whole shift just for us ITS service management professionals. But what's happening now is we have to then figure out how do I take this new way of thinking around services and value streams and processes, and how do I get an entire technology organization to understand that? Yeah. Right. Because when I now I'm coming to have a conversation around process related to value stream, you know, if I if I got deer in headlights before with version three, I'm really going to get deer in headlight version now because I'm trying to learn it. So, you know, I think our biggest challenge, which we're going to experience, and I think all companies are going to experience is how do you I'm no longer just educating my team, right? The service management office, we got to get certain certified and idle and, you know, maybe some COVID training and Six Sigma training, like that's our world. But now we're forcing that out into an organization that are getting different skills, right? So they're focused on Azure and cloud development and agile and all these other frameworks. But now we're trying to apply something they don't really understand. So now we have to take on the role of teachers, right? And, and not, not teachers, but we have to change a culture that is much bigger than just my service management world. Um, and I think that's going to be interesting, especially when you plug process into that. Yeah. Well, you know, Susan uh, just made a comment. Um, when it comes to change, it's about selling, not telling. And I think there's a, there's, there's a lot of truth in that statement because, you know, we in IT, you know, take, we're very, you know, people in IT tend to be very technology focused. And, um, you know, a lot of people are even skeptical in IT can be skeptical of, of sales, and they, you know, they just want to talk about the facts and the programs, but we're not the best communicators sometimes of, of, of selling that value upstream. So, you know, there's a process there in ITEL, business relationship management, where the skill sets of that process are really more about communicating value and, and then demonstrating the effectiveness of a program. And I think we need to put more focus in, in that, you know, selling, not telling, but, but backing up the selling with real facts, like, you know, here's how this is improved. This is the return on investment that we got from it, but we're not, you know, I'm not sure if IT people are always the best communicators. There's another question here, Rick. Um, so anonymous, uh, can you provide some examples of KPIs you've used to measure the function of business process management outside of the specific KPI being measured in the process being designed optimized? Um, yeah, that's a, that I don't, I don't have off the top of my head examples, but when we apply to a, let's say if I'm having, which I'm going to do, right, we're going to have a function for process management, right? So there's a lot of KPIs in that space that we're going to have to define and it all revolves around the governance of process. Um, and you could talk about things like, you know, how many, you know, the, the, I want to, I need to improve X percentage of process uh, across this domain um, annually, or I need to do uh, improve process 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 assessment mature process maturity level of process X domain uh, by a certain percentage. Right, so we're going to go through a process where we're going to have to start defining those KPIs for this function are around that's going to be operating within the BPM of space. Um, and it really, that conversation is going to be driven as well by what leadership wants to see for KPIs, right? And, and that's another conversation we need to have is understanding what's important to leadership, what aligns to the strategy, how this function supports that will drive the KPIs we will develop in that space. Yeah, so we have like for a specific process, you might say that the, the number of changes that went in went in without a change ticket being created or the number of unsuccessful changes are very specific KPIs to a process. But, you know, when you want to look at the program, you know, yeah. um, if you if you look at the uh, from a program perspective, how many processes have we, you know, have we ensured or how many processes have we assessed this year to ensure that, um, you know, we're tracking improvements? Or have we have we looked at the overall repository and looked at how how frequently those processes are updated? We might have thirty processes in the repository, but uh, you know th you know twenty eight of them have not been touched in three years. So there are program metrics that look yeah. like across, and then there's specific metrics that look in into. But I think you know it's around it's around governance, it's around continual improvement, it's around you know making sure your process that it, the consistency is going across. I think those would be some of the things that would address the broader program as opposed to specific. 
Yeah, and in the identification phase, which honestly is where we're at, right? It's it's looking across the enterprise and saying, okay, I've got 10 different units running their own change processes. So maybe one of my governance KPIs is to say, you know, reduce that by X percentage this year to consolidate process into a single uh, process model and tool. Um, so there's, you know, again, it, it's what is what's important to leadership, right? Uh, and, and I think a lot of what we're doing here is with all of the different services that, that JCI honestly runs around the world, um, and we are talking global here, you know, we've got, a, it's going to take time to do an inventory and assessment across the organization to identify things that we present back to leadership to have them help us define those KPIs that we can measure. You know, one of the, um, you know, if you go back to those, like the, pull, the bullets of, you know, discovery, design and modeling, uh, process execution, process and business process automation, governance and continual improvement, the, the, the five or six pieces that make up business process management, you know, you can, you can look at things like what percentage of your processes have been automated or been reviewed for automation. So see the program goes beyond any specific process. So you can look at things like what, you know, what processes are, are and you need that discovery, but what processes are great candidates for automation? And mm -hmm. someone has to look at that outside of any, a change manager is not looking at that outside of the change management process, but some, some centralized body needs to be looking at that saying, hey, we got all these processes, which ones are automated, which ones are candidates for automation, which ones haven't been updated, documented, or, or you know, are being- Another part of that, right, is, you know, are you, are you is it something you want to invest in, right? Do you want to invest in automation to get this much, you know, value out of the squeeze this much, you know, right. value out of the out of the the value chain. Um, but again, these are very much an active dialogue with leadership. Here's our findings. Here's where you get to have savings. Do you want to invest in it? If not, we'll move on to the next one and find something else. Right. I think the other thing on that I wanted to touch on with this slide, particularly, is it's not just about resistance, um, because when you're in an organization, uh, more often than not, you'll find areas within the organization who actually want your help. Right. So it's they they yeah. want to improve. So you, you've you got to balance this. Here's what I'm pushing out to the organization in terms of standards, process design, maturity models, all of this versus teams that are going help. I need help. I need to define this because I don't really I where do I tie into other process areas? How do I leverage change effectively to streamline my workflow? So they're coming to they, they need to have a place to go for help or guidance or information or knowledge. So, you know, OCM does work both ways. It's not just about dealing with the resistance to change. It's also being able to uh, provide, and, and again, I'm jumping ahead, Dave, I'm sorry, but provide oh, yeah. a service to the organization to facilitate the change that they want. You know, and I think, um, I think the, what we, we saw when we were doing consulting work, right? And of course you've been in that space yourself, um, assessments are great vehicles, not, you know, a lot of people think an assessment is about getting a score, right? Oh, am I a three? Am I a five? But an assessment is a great opportunity to go out and talk to people and find out what's not working in their, in their world and saying, you know, what if we can solve some of those problems? So I, I, you know, when it comes to organizational change, don't underestimate the power of doing an assessment up front, because that is a really good way of a finding out what the pain points are and B you know, um, you know, demonstrating that, you know, you're there to help those people. So I, I think an assessment can be a great piece. Hey, there's a comment, I think that came in here. I think that in some cases, companies uh, change their processes to adapt to technology. And this should be the other way around. Technology should adapt to the business process. Any, any thoughts on? Yeah, I got a lot of thoughts on this one because it happens all the time. You know, it's funny and it's not just technology, right? So um, I'm, I'm going back a few years, you know, pre, pre where I am today. And I'll give you a good example where um, audit comes in to do an audit, right? And, you know, when auditors walk in nine times out of 10, the first thing they say is show me your process, right? Mm -hmm. And that's great. So we had an audit that was done um, and it came back with, let's say, four or five findings. And the findings are owned by the technology areas to mitigate the risk of the findings. And so I got brought into the conversation. And what I found was is for each individual finding of that audit, they were solutioning for each finding. 
right? And so when I looked at all of the findings, I said, the audit was based on this process. Where is the process? Show me the process. And because if you, if you solve for the process, then you can deal with the findings. And the, the answer was there was no process. It was just something that you know, this particular team was doing over the years as part of, as they evolved into dealing with tickets. Yeah. And so it became a conversation around, okay, the audit needs to be put on hold. We need to go back. We need to define your process, design it based on the frameworks that the audit used to assess you against and create findings against. And then now that you have your bright, shiny new process, and we've been able to architect the solution to the findings, your findings go away and you're not point solutioning for every individual finding. You're, you're solutioning for what they're measuring you against, which is the process. So you're right that we often, and again, it's evolution, right? So technology is all about technology. Um, but underlying that, technology delivers some business process and is supported by some business process. If you define that accurately and efficiently against the frameworks and even you know, with tweaks to suit your business. Like I, I love a world where, you know, they walk in, an auditor walk in and go, show me your change management process. And you you go, okay, here's my process definition document. Here's 50 examples of it being executed in evidence. And the auditor comes back and goes, okay, we're done moving on to the next thing, right? That's where you want to be with process is to be able to just say, print, here it is. This is how we execute it. Here's our evidence to meet your requirements. And nine times out of 10, you don't have to be hassled by audits. Well, you know, that I, I have some thoughts on that. Um, but first of all, I wanted to thank Fabian for that question. So Fabian, thank you for that. Yeah, thank you for all the questions. Yeah, um, but when you look at, yeah, exactly. Do you, if you look at the frameworks, right, they'll say that uh, one of the control objectives, for example, for change management is how do you, is around how you deal with emergency changes. So if you designed how you deal with emergency changes into your process, the chan and, and govern it and, and follow it, the chances are you're not going to get a finding around how you deal with emergency changes. So, you know, if you work with the frameworks and you work with things like COVID, you have, and maybe you sit down with your auditors as part of the process, they're a stakeholder in the design of the process. What do you want us to solve for? You'll have a much better chance of success in passing those audits. So you shouldn't be afraid of the auditors, the auditors that can actually help you design a process that meets you know, the regulatory or the, you know, the, the governmental, whatever standards, you know. Yeah, I just had that conversation this morning, actually. I was asked about my opinion based on an audit, and I said, or a contribution to the development of controls based on a framework. And, and my response was, I love it. Like, I don't, I, I want every control that that framework provides, I want to see it because I need to make, evaluate my processes to make sure that the process aligns to the controls because, if you audit me and you have findings, I love findings because now it allows me to go back to leadership to prioritize my workload and, and, and risk to, to develop process to mitigate that, that finding, right? So audit, uh, a lot of people fear audit. I love audit because it helps enhance and mature and normalize process. Yeah, it's part of your continual improvement. Um, great comment in here from Murray. Uh, Murray says, tools are cool, but process rules. Um, your tooling should reflect organizational decisions around process design. You shouldn't you know, adjust your organization to fit the tool. And boy, we've seen that you know, back when we were doing a lot of ITSM work and people were moving from one tool to another. The amount of times you know, they switch to a new tool and in, in, and in the and in, in, in the, you know, uh, uh, the mandate to implement out of the box, they find out there's huge gaps now in their process because they never went set. A, a real simple example was this insurance company we were working with. They, they had some stuff in the process that required data transfers between different regions. And uh, the tool, because no one did the process design work, when they implemented the tool, that whole piece was missing. And they had to come up with a whole bunch of workarounds post-implementation to address those things because no... They were they were so you know dead set on implementing out of the box. They spent no time looking at the existing process and seeing what what is it we're really trying to do here and meet the needs of the stakeholders. Uh, another uh, question just came in. So hi Rick and David, and that's from uh, Karthik. 
today, process um, today the process owner community is used to uh, is used to process delivery. Excuse me, I'm just trying to. <laughs> Should no, I got it. I, I think I, I read this and I understood okay. it, right? So, uh, which is used to, uh, used to be, uh, transaction-based KPIs, right? So mean time to resolution, mean time to repair, things like that. Um, what's the key to bringing the value-driven thinking on how to focus on the value-driven and benefit realization from a process? This goes back to the whole manager maturity and thinking differently around managing it as a business and not just the transaction. Um, apart from the classic ITSM process where process is aligned to best practice framework, how can we enable or educate the other side of the enterprise, risk and finance, uh, to a value-driven process delivery? And, and, and that is a great question. And the one thing that stands out to leadership or even risk is the, the big driver for any company is money, right? So uh, another example in the past that I've had is, you know, we were trying to articulate a baseline for major incidents. And... I, I hate to say this, but it's actually something that that is fun in my head, which is a scary place to be, is it's almost like you have to become a data scientist, right? So it's more than just, um, I had a major incident, the outage lasted four hours, um, and it affected these businesses. Okay, great. What does that mean, right? What does leadership care about? What does risk care about? Then you go deeper and you start talking about what is the financial impact to the business, right? Now you got to start turning into a data scientist. And, you, and we actually, again, former life, we got to a point where we were like, what is the, what is the run rate per hour for a, the average X level professional in the company? It's this much per hour, right? Okay, this outage impacted these business areas. How many professionals are in those business areas? X number of professionals. So that you do the math and the data science and you say, the duration of this outage cost the company $2 million. You know, and and for this quarter, it cost the company $12, $15 million for the number of outages we have. That's your baseline. So now in the next quarter, you run the same report and you say, okay, through these process enhancements that we implemented around incident management, we've reduced the number of major incidents because we made process changes in event management, for example, um, that has reduced the number of outages by 10%. Then you say, you run the math again, you go, okay, we've saved the company uh, revenue impact of X because of the reduction in the number of incidents because of the process improvements we've done in event and incident. So it is possible, but again, you know, where is your, where is your, um, your process management uh, maturity in being able to get to that point, right? So we all have to start somewhere and it's really MTT, MTTR and the basics but eventually you want to mature to a point where you can start associating process to dollars, right? For, and, and whether that's headcount saved on automation or new projects that were able to be spun up because I now have resources freed up because of automation to add additional business value. Like, so it, it is a loaded question and you can get there. Again, it goes back to, is leadership willing to invest in a function like process management to realize that level of maturity down the road um, and are they going to support you to get there? So great question. Uh, same thing for risk. Risk always has a mitigation effect on cost or regulatory impact, you know, or fines. You know, I, I, you could come up with metrics, uh, process metrics for asset management, software asset management specifically that deal with risk. You know, my process improvements have allowed me to report on software license compliance exponentially faster than I could before, reducing the amount of, of audit risk from vendors, which saved the company $3 million quarterly or annually. Like, so you can get into some data science here, uh, but ultimately that's where process needs to get to in terms of demonstrating value. Sorry, I could talk about this all day long. No, this these are great. I, me I remember this one project we worked on, uh, our sponsor was having trouble getting the getting the funding for a change management process re-engineering project and uh you know people couldn't see the value we have a change management program we've been doing changes for years what you know why would we need to invest in that and we just did a, a, a really simple you know almost back of the envelope analysis that said well what are the, you know we went around and, and interviewed a number of the senior management and asked what are the, some of the most significant major incidents that you'd seen over a past period of time um 
after speaking to a number of people, there was a handful, maybe two or three, that everyone recognized as being very, very significant and very serious to the organization. We went to the folks in the disaster recovery group and, and who had done business impact analysis against those and actually came up with some costs associated with those and said, you know what? The reason that outage happened was because, you know, you allowed people to implement a change with no documentation and no fallback plan. And we were able to easily demonstrate that. And I, so there's, you know, as Rick said, you have to get into the data science of it, but uh, those are great points, Rick. One more question is, um, is Navia looking to integrate with process mining products uh, that could accelerate uh, process design and improvements? Um, at this, you know, at this point, this is definitely one of the things on, on, on our, um, on our list of things we'd like to do. We have a lot of stuff on the roadmap and some exciting changes that are going to be coming out in the, um, in the, in the not too distant future. But we actually had some interesting conversations with a firm that uh, deal with process mining. So uh, I don't want to commit to anything at this point on the webinar. But yeah, we have been looking into process mining and the importance of process mining. And there's some interesting technologies out there. Um, all right, I think we'll move on to the next uh, the next question here. So uh, I think we've talked about a lot. Yeah, I was just gonna, I was just yeah. going to say I think we've covered. Yeah, so uh, uh, communicating the bottom line benefits there's the cost associated associated with process management, people's time, resources, tooling. So I think we've really covered this this topic. Uh, is there anything else you want to add to communicating the return on investment around process management? Um. You know, no, not really. I mean, it's just as part of the holistic overview of all of it, right? So you need to think about what you know. Navia is is our is our key tool, right? I mean, hands down. But then, what other tools can you use for process management to help augment um, the non-design related tools? You know, so things like, and I, I touched on this a little bit, like Six Sigma. Um, you know, interfacing with problem management because they're going to generate a lot of process conversation, making sure they're aware of the process management group as well. So when they're doing root cause analysis on major incidents, they may identify a process that caused an outage, right? So who do they go to um, to help further that conversation around the process piece of it, right? So it's 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 a broader aspect than just I mean it's it's a really big and honestly a a good function to really think about and consider initiating in any company no matter if it's one or two people or you know five or ten people based on the size of your organization but process needs to be elevated to take on a certain level of importance in any organization. So the um, the last topic I want to talk about here today and I think. Everything we've been talking about kinds of kind of leads up to this one this one piece, but it's around the area of providing process management as a service. You know, um, there are some unique skills, and I think especially when you look at the overall managing the program as opposed to a specific discipline like change management. Um, but that task is often, you know, this whole task of process management is often left to us, to the operational staff who may not be specialized in in that. What are your thoughts about process management as a service? Um, I, I think it's important. Um, I think it's it's greatly important. Uh, again, you know, we've all evolved from a world where, oh, I need to document a process. I'm going to fire a Visio and go for it or PowerPoint and go for it. Um, if you take process management as a service, if you, if you build an organization um, around process management and process governance, Right, so it's great to assess process maturity. It's great to look at an inventory and make sure people are updating it on a regular basis. But what about those teams and organizations where they're not familiar with where to start in designing a process, right? So it, it, it made us think about this idea of, well, if I staff with process analysts who are trained and skilled in BPMN and Navia and, you know, it should be part of our service to go out or on request, go sit down with a team or an area and help them design their process, right? Help them understand, you know, the interfaces, the racy components, query them. It's almost like a BA for process where right. you're asking probing questions of a technologist to draw out of them what's a process versus a procedure versus an activity 
Um, who's responsible? Who's their account? Wait, it's not your team. It's that team over there. Okay, now I've just built the process interface. I'm documenting it. And now I can go have that conversation. But you know, that's not something that's necessarily going to exist within an organization without this as a service because they're going to design a process for their area because that's their silo. But having this service, this design analyst, if you will, come in and ask probing questions, you may walk in to help a team design one process, but walk out realizing there's four other teams you need to go engage proactively to help design their process to show the integration between the two. Because at the end of the day, when you come back, you could have a life cycle and go, okay, there's several areas of fat in this life cycle. We can reduce streamline automate or, or reduce duplication to enhance the overall functionality of the organization. So I, I see this as very much a function of process management as a group, um, just no differently than process design, process governance, inventory management, you know, all of those are offerings, if you will, of a service called process management. And it's very similar to what we're doing or uh, what we want to do in the service portfolio space, right? Mm -hmm. You could sit down with anybody in the organization and go, okay, great. You're in networking. What's your service? Uh, uh, I implement routers. Okay. I want a router. What, what is your offering? Uh, I don't know. Here's what you should be thinking and here's how you do it. And you end up drawing it out of them and teaching them at the same time. Well, process is very much like that. Anybody can draw boxes on a Visio or a PowerPoint, but getting them to think differently around, okay, what's the activity within that process? Okay, that activity has what procedures beneath it? What are your inputs, your outputs, your tools you're using? Um, what are the SLAs you may wanna to apply to that particular activity? Um, only somebody who does that as a function or a service can help facilitate the conversation with a technologist delivering that. Um, to get them to understand that, oh, all of that is a process. It's more than just boxes on a screen, right? Um, and so we're taking the approach of saying, you know, when I define a service for process management, we're gonna have a set of offerings. Those offerings we're gonna define, we're gonna staff appropriately to deliver those offerings. Um, and we're gonna offer it to the IT organization. So, you know, if you have a process you want designed, call on us, we'll come and sit down and, and work with you like we would any other service. Sorry. I think it, that, well said. I mean, uh, you're right. People, you need unique skills like interviewing, requirements gathering. There's a lot of skills that are unique and you could really, when you have those skills combined with the subject matter expertise of the process owner and the process manager, you're going to do a great job. So Rick, I just want to, we're at the top of the hour here. I just want to say thank you so much. We could, we could go on for another two oh, hours yeah. without, without a doubt. <laughs> So, I'm sure some of my team in the in this session as well will say the same thing. Like I can literally talk about this stuff for days. Oh, for sure. But your your value, your insight, the things you brought to the to conversation your day were so much appreciated. And we really want to thank you for the time you spent with us today. Now, thank just, you for having me. Oh, of course. And just to wrap things up, just a couple of things for those of you again who are not familiar with Navia, we have the tool called the Navia Process Designer, and it really was built on our understanding of business process management with tools to, to actually help with the process management program, including such things as process design and sharing, user story and requirement gathering, the assessment and governance of your processes, lots of valued templates to get you started based on those frameworks like ITEL, APQC, COBIT. And um, in terms of the pricing, it's one of the best values in process management. You know, it's got the right set of tools at the right price point that could really help accelerate your uh, program. And if you're interested in looking at Navia, you can schedule a, a personalized demo. You can just go to navia.com slash contact and we'd be happy to set something up. Last piece of business before we, we wrap up, there's two more webinars coming up in this year's webinar series. So the next uh, webinar is, the registration will probably open next week, is on the 30th of March, Best Practices for Business Process Automation in ServiceNow. And we have a panel made up of people from Christiana Care, a healthcare organization, the Knights of Columbus and Yale University. And um, on May 11th, how to design and document your processes to drive efficiency and reduce costs. So we hope we can see some of you on those upcoming webinars. Thank you all for being here and being attentive and, and your, your questions were great. We really do appreciate that and hope we can see you on an upcoming webinar. Once again, thanks so much, Rick. Any, any final thanks, comments? Guys. No, um, I mean, you know, the typical, you can find me on LinkedIn. 
yes. And of course, this, this has been recorded, so we'll be sending you a link to the recording, and you can feel free to share this with your, with your colleagues. So thank you, everyone, and I wish you all a, a wonderful day. Take care. Bye.